God will speak to you. Pray that God will minister to your heart, your soul, your spirit. Pray that God will make, um, will turn something on in your life. Pray that he will turn something around, that he will accomplish his purposes today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we uh, submit our members unto you. I submit my spirit, soul, intellect, O oh God, unto you. I say, Lord, use me to uh, convey your oracles, your divine agenda for today, for the moment, in Jesus' name. And I pray for everyone who's listening to me in-house and, Lord, online, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you will meet them at the point of their needs that, Lord, you will minister to us in the middle of our circumstances and bring divine, supernatural answers to the questions of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We will take our gathering declaration before the word. So please say after me, I proclaim Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The Lord is the shepherd of my soul, my shelter by day, my light by night. In his name, we plow our fields. By his spirit, we gather the harvest. In his light, we seek and find. In this year of gathering, the Lord of the harvest has commanded, launch out into the deep. And at his word, we cast our nets. We gather in souls and substance for God's kingdom. The Lord is our reward. In this season, I receive God's portion set aside for me and shout it out loud full measure pressed down shaken together and running over nothing is lost nothing is wasted in Jesus' name amen and amen amen Yesterday, I was um, on a Facebook Live program. I was being interviewed by an organization called Masterpiece um, about intentional living for uh, men in the diaspora. And then along the line, there was a question that dropped into my heart, and I asked the interviewer this question and the listeners this question. I said, when was the last time you saw God coming to do something here on earth by himself. And there is no answer for that, amen? Because none of us has ever seen God right here physically doing something on earth. And so with that question in your mind, I want us to go in Genesis chapter 2. That's not the main verse, but I would like to just start there. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, we read that, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Amen? And what this verse tells me is that God wanted someone to do on earth what he would have been doing if he were here physically. God wanted somebody to do in his place, representing him like an ambassador, amen, what he would have been doing if he were here physically. That's when he reached out for the man. Amen. Hallelujah. And also in Ephesians, if you wanted to uh, support that, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul said, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
So, in a way, God is commissioning all men, fathers, husbands, to represent him just like he, to, to copy Christ, to walk in the steps of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Love your wives just as. Somebody say just as. So, it's talking about a role model right there. Just like copy somebody, copy Christ. And so that means that God actually placed man on the earth to represent him, to represent him. We are representatives of God on the earth and also function as role models to others here on earth. Fathers, that's a big responsibility, to be God's resident representatives here on earth. Amen? Amen. Uh, so it's obvious that God's original intent for the human male is that the male will function as God's representative and also as a godly role model in the home. To, to help us explore this subject, I would like us to look at the story of one man in the Bible who um, I believe played the role of, number one, God's representative, and number two, as a godly role model. Somebody say God, God's representative. And godly role model. There's one man that appeared to play that role pretty well. And he is one man we don't talk a lot about. When we read about the prodigal son, we don't talk a lot about the father of the prodigal son. So today we are going to throw the light on the father of the prodigal son. And please come with me to Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 24. Long one, so we'll read it quickly. Um, very familiar story. Luke 15, 11 to 24. Then he said, that is Jesus Christ said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions and prodigal, uh, with prodigal living. Prodigal meaning wasteful, wasteful living. But when he had spent all, there arose severe, a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the, his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, um, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put, on, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. Amen. What a story. Amen. Very interesting story. So much to share. So much to learn in that story. And I just 
<coughs> wanted to um, draw our attention to the fact that usually when we talk about this um, story, um, we emphasize the misbehavior, <laughs> right? The misbehavior of the young son, right? That seems to be the theme of the story and how he repented and returned. Um, but this story is actually about the lost. It's actually about the lost. So it makes me believe, because the, the reason I know it's about the lost is that that whole chapter is talking about things that are lost. Jesus talked about the lost sheep, okay? That you leave the 99 and go after the one, right? And then Jesus talked about the lost coin, the lost silver coin, that a woman lost silver coin in her room and turned on the light and swept the whole house and all of that. And then this is what the third, the third parable in order, talking about things that are lost and our attitude towards things that are lost. So sometimes, I just want to say before I even start preaching, that um, when we think people are misbehaving, they might be lost. Amen. For fathers, for fa substitute fathers, who are women that are fathering, okay? There are some women that are also fathering. You are fathers, and we applaud you. Let's give them a hand, amen? Yes, let's give them a hand. Um, and then for fa uh, pastors and leaders in the church, for leaders in business and other areas, sometimes the misbehavior of others may not really be misbehavior. It may just be that they are lost or they lack some kind of knowledge or discipline that they, the approach to the lost, I believe that our approach to the lost is different than our approach to those who misbehave. Amen? Okay, and with that said, we, from the story that we just read, and I'm not going to go ahead and summarize it, I believe it's self-explanatory, I want us to glean some of the godly characteristics that this father demonstrated. And I, I hope and pray that this uh, will um, help our fathers to identify their, you know, ways in which they can model the nature of God to the people that look up to us. So we are identifying godly characteristics, and we hope that it will be a good, um, you know, lesson for us, a good template for us to build on. Number one. The very first characteristic of God that we see this father um, demonstrate is that he provided a home. He provided a home which is a safe place, a place of dwelling for his family. Everything, the setting for this whole, you know, story was in the home. Amen. That is what God himself did in the beginning. Before God made man, he made the heavens and the earth. He made the earth to be the, in the, the home of, of, of the, man, the man that he was going to create. He provided oxygen. He provided plants for food, animals for food. He provided everything that we would need, water, before he even brought man on the scene. Amen? Amen. So providing a home base, a place of safety, a place of protection and security, a place of structure. The home is a place of structure. It's a place of order that children learn to more, to, 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 how to live life here on earth. So this man provided a home. Um, growing up in a home is always different from growing up elsewhere. You know that. If you see two individuals stand side by side, you can almost tell the one who grew up in a home and the one who grew up elsewhere, maybe on the streets or in another place. And so we want fathers, I want to commission us, we should always provide, a, and a home is different from a house, right? Hallelujah. A home is contextual. It's not just, it's not a physical place necessarily, but it's a setting. A home is a setting that 
contains all that a man would need, a child would need. Hallelujah. So, and yesterday we learned something during our men's discussion. The home is an atmosphere, a conducive atmosphere that people need to grow up in. So providing a home, a conducive atmosphere, is a godly character. And we want to model that godly character as men, as godly role models. This, the second thing, second characteristic that we see this man demonstrate was that he considered his son's preferences and he actually listened and respected his choices. As foolish as they may sound, he listened. Amen? Somebody say he listened. I know it's a controversial one. I know there are fathers that would say, why should I listen to my, my son's foolishness? <laughs> he was being stupid, honestly. He was being um, very ignorant and misled. Hallelujah. The way that the story ended, you realize that this son really lost his way. He misbehaved. In actual fact, asking for your inheritance when your father is still alive it's like saying, I want you dead. It's like saying, to me, you are dead already. That is what he was trying to say. You no longer exist, so let me go and live my life. Hallelujah. But the lesson that we can glean from it is that, from this father's response is that, um, he did not dismiss all of his children's requests. He was willing to consider their preferences. He was willing to give them the opportunity to make decisions so they can learn from the consequences of their decisions. Amen. Especially when our children begin to grow up and they are now into the upper teens and the um, young adulthood. During those ages, they feel they got it all together. <laughs> Somebody said when we were little, our parents were like heroes. When we grow older, we are in the upper teens and young adulthood, we think they don't know anything. And then when we grow older, like upper 20s and 30s, then we realize, wow, my father, my, they, 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 they really did well. <laughs> when you see one or two things in life and you encounter a few things, then you come back and honor your parents. Amen. And um, God himself did that for Adam and Eve. Do you think God didn't know that the serpent was tempting them? God knew. He is omnipresent. He was right there in the spirit watching it, the transaction all happen. He could have stopped, the, he could have stopped Eve from making the decision to eat the, the fruit. But he wanted them to exercise the power of choice and learn from the consequences of our decisions and their replication. It's a big, I believe that when that guy came back home finally, his life would have changed forever. Amen? His life, the lesson that he learned was a lifelong lesson that would take him for the rest of his life. Hallelujah. So sometimes we try to remote control our children, and I just want to encourage you, and I want to encourage our women also, when they begin to grow older, let's begin to give them, cut them a slack, give, give them some room, let them make some decisions. They might fall, they might get hurt, God forbid, but they will learn lifelong lessons. Hallelujah. Amen. So the second thing I noticed over there, he considered his son's preferences he actually respected, although it was a foolish request, he respected that request and, and went ahead and honored it. I, wow, that beats my imagination, but he honored the requests. Amen. The third thing that I noticed there is that it, it's obvious that this father taught his children, number three, he taught his children some godly values and principles to live by when they were younger. And I will explain. Amen? Somebody will be like, why? He, he behaved stupidly. What did he learn? The man, the father, must have taught them some godly values 
and some principles to live by, he deposited something in them when they were younger. The story said that after he wasted all his resources and then there was farming and he was, you know, after all was said and done, let's look at verse 18 of the, 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 the passage we just read. It says, this is what he said. I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Where did he learn about heaven? Amen. He knew about the concept of sin. He knew about the concept of heaven. And he must have learned it. I believe there was also a, a, a mother in the house. The story left that essential part out. Amen. The story, if I were there, when they were writing this, I would say, a certain man and woman had children. Amen. <laughs> so don't worry, women, they didn't say it, but then we know that there was a mother in the house as well. But this man deposited something in the other. The son knew about heaven. He knew about sin. He knew about the consequences of sinful behavior. And uh, Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. We, when we teach our children things, especially in their formative years, we are depositing a seed that will yield fruit. It will yield fruit. Even if they miss they take a different tangent, a different turn along the line, that seed will speak in Jesus' name. That speed, it will be remembered. Something will click. A light will be turned on and they will remember. That is what happened to this guy. He was in total darkness, but there was a light on the inside of him that spoke. Hallelujah. Sometimes when we are teaching them, it will appear as if nothing is going down. <laughs> I don't know if you, <laughs> you've been there before. Uh, you are training and they are talking back and you are talking and they are like asking questions and you would think you are not making impact. But I just want to encourage you. Something is going down. You, yeah, something is going down. Hallelujah. The fourth thing, um, this father has shown the godly fathers have a habit of looking out for looking out for and seeking after their lost children. He was constantly looking out for. Godly fathers look out for and they seek after their lost children. The story says in verse 20 that this is what the story says. But when the boy, when the boy was still a great way off, when he was far away, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. And what it means to me is that every morning, this father had a habit of waking up, sitting on the front porch, maybe with his tea or whatever, coffee, amen. Amen. And then he'll be looking on the way. When is my son coming back? When is my son coming back? Because at that older age, you don't have a very good vision anyway. So why was it that he spotted him far away? He must have been looking intently. That is the only way he would notice him from afar off. Amen. Hallelujah. On this Father's Day, I just want to encourage all fathers... Let's pursue our lost children. Let's pursue our lost children. I want to encourage pastors, including myself, let's pursue our lost church members. Amen? Hallelujah. It is the character of God to pursue the lost. And we must copy that on this day, on this special day. Let's learn it says, you leave the 99, he'll follow, he'll go after you. It can only be God, amen, to look out for someone who insulted you in the face and wished you dead. It can only be God. This can only be a godly character. It cannot be human. Amen. 
All right? Let's look at the fifth uh, lesson. We have seven, and we'll round up seven. But let's look at the number five. Uh, godly characteristic that this man demonstrated in this story. He forgave his son without any hesitation and without any conditions. The man just, for, in fact, <laughs> hallelujah. Somebody say he forgave without any strings attached. Amen. And um, our world has become so transactional, tick for tat, that it would be un almost unimaginable um, that a, a father would just forgive this grave sin without conditions. That, oh, you will come back, but you will be in the boys' quarters. Amen? <laughs> you will come back, but you will be one of the servants. You, I will make you the chief servant. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, that means you will come back, but you have no more inheritance. You have to ask, sign, sign over here. <laughs> I, I know a lot of... <laughs> come on, fathers, are we here? <laughs> Wouldn't we? <laughs> Praise God. Thank God for godliness. Amen. Some father, you would want him to mourn in ashes and sackcloth. For seven days before he is accepted back. Hallelujah. But then this father, he, you know, the boy had rehearsed an official speech. He wrote a speech, he, a, a repentance speech, and he rehearsed it well. So when he got to his father, he started to recite his speech. The, I, I, get, I can almost promise you the father didn't listen to his speech. Somebody say, wow. The father did not listen to that speech. He knew what he was going to do. He had been wanting to do it all along. He was yearning for him, longing for him to come back. So as soon as he saw him, it was game time. Amen? He didn't even want him to apologize. I'm not saying don't apologize, children. Amen? <laughs> you must be remorseful for your behaviors. But then the father did not wait for the uh, uh, repentance to happen. I mean, it, honestly, I, I also want to say that the, the guy must have repented already. <laughs> right? He would not show up kneeling down and begging. and I, I mean, He would not show up in the way he did without repenting. Amen. So his actions showed that he had repented already. And in actual fact, in this story, you will realize that um, we didn't read that far, but there was an older brother, and his behavior, I mean, actually the older brother represented the Pharisees. That's what Jesus was trying to communicate. We, uh, the, the younger brother represented you and I, who were Gentiles, who did not belong. We were enemies. We misbehaved, and God accepted us back home, amen? But the older brother represented the Pharisees who were living according to the law and they thought they have been home all this while and they have been doing all the things they should do and why is it that God will accept us back? Amen? That's the lesson in that, the, the spiritual lesson in that story. Hallelujah. So um, there are some people who um, would have wanted this guy to be punished but God had a different plan. And he said, we, we are never too far gone. We are never, God's mind is that no matter our background, no matter how deep you have sunk, in reality, asking for your inheritance is one of the gravest sins you can commit while your parents are alive. But God's mind says that no matter how deep you have sunk, you are never too far gone. You are never too, there's a song like that, right? Yes, you are never too far gone. Hallelujah. He said, it doesn't matter what you've done, you're never too far gone. That is lesson number five. Six, I believe this father <laughs> is not like an African father. <laughs> and I will explain, amen. I believe this father, I mean, maybe even if it's an African father, he's um, our generation. He's not the older generation African father because the older generation African father will not show affection openly. Amen. We've been there, right? 
<laughs> they laughed us all the same, but they don't, it, it was as if it was feminine. It was a feminine character to show love and affection openly. Amen? Even to their wives. Even to their wives. Sometimes I want to give my wife a kiss in church or somewhere, and she's like, oh, no, no, don't do it here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, she wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they, <laughs> anyway, so this guy, the story says what? He ran, the man ran, he hugged and kissed his son. He fell on his, uh, his neck. It's like, I've been waiting for you. Where have you been all this time? It doesn't matter what the neighbors were saying. That this, yeah, that's the guy who misbehaved. And when I look at how the father is behaving, as if he's a woman. Amen? No. He, that, I think that's what David also did. David loved the Lord so much, he danced and exposed himself. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the observers are saying. This man showed affection so openly. He did not care what others were thinking. He kissed him, he loved on him, he hugged him, and he commanded, um, he commanded his servants to come and decorate him. Jesus did not die for us secretly. So when it comes to loving him back and loving God's people, we must do it openly as well. Amen? Love must be done publicly, demonstrated publicly. Hallelujah. And the last lesson here is that this father did not only forgive his son, but he went to the extent of restoring him, celebrating him. Amen? This prodigal and wasteful son. So um, we can learn from this story that it is a godly characteristic. It is a godly characteristic for fathers to restore and celebrate their lost children. Restore and celebrate our lost children. There's nothing wrong with it. In look in the story that we just read, it says that um, Luke chapter 15, verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who ju uh, 99 just persons who need no repent. I'll read that again. This verse comes before the verses we just read. So it's the same chapter, chapter 15, verse 7. This is what God does in heaven. I say to you, Jesus speaking, that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Amen? So in the same way as there is joy in heaven when a sinner repents, a father celebrates and restores his child when they, they come back home. Hallelujah. It is in the nature of fathers to restore and celebrate. So on this Father's Day, I just want to encourage us, let's demonstrate this godly character you know, as much as possible. Let's demo if you are not a father yet, please put these seven points in your pocket for the future. Amen. Put them in your pocket. And if we've been fathers for a while, let's go back and revisit our notes and see how we are doing. And uh, let's, let's step up one notch. Let's lift the game one notch to uh, become godly role models. Let's, and, and I want us to be on our feet. I want us to pray. I want us to pray, be on our feet. This gentleman, um, man in the um, story, we said that he provided a home which is a safe place of dwelling. He um, considered his son's preferences and actually respected their choices. Um, it takes a lot of maturity and love and to do such a thing. When somebody is doing something you know is clearly wrong, and yet you have the patience to listen and even consider granting their request, it can only be God. Amen. And then thirdly, he taught his children some godly values and principles when they were younger. So, so fathers, let's seize the moment and begin to sow some seeds. Godly fathers have a habit of looking out for and seeking after their lost children. And then he forgave without hesitation 
with no conditions. And number six, his, he did not hide his love for his son. He openly demonstrated his love. And finally, he restored and celebrated his son just like God celebrates the repentant sinner in heaven. Let's begin to pray right now. I don't know which direction you want to pray in. You might want to pray for your father. You might want to pray for yourself because you are playing the role of a father. You might want to pray into your future that you can do this. You might want to repent. You might want to ask God for forgiveness because you have seen some things here that you did not do. Let's begin to pray. Let somebody begin to cry out. You might want to pray for your husband that he will demonstrate these things to your children. Let's begin to pray and pray for this, about this conviction that the Lord has brought us today. The way he's convicted us about his method of fathering, his method of fathering. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we worship you. We thank you, Lord, for showing us godliness, the trait of a godly father. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the illumination. We thank you, Lord, for the deposits that you have made. We thank you, Lord, for the eternal truths that are in your word. And we pray, oh God, that these truths will be demonstrated in our lives, in our homes, in our church, I pray. I pray for myself, oh God, as a pastor. Lord, that you will help me as a father as well. Help me to demonstrate these characteristics in the name of Jesus. I pray for every man listening to me. Give us the grace to demonstrate godly fatherhood in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you're out there and you believe that you are in the place that this prodigal son was at, that you, 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 you missed your way, that your life may not be pleasing unto the Lord and you need to come back home. You need to come back home. You just want to bow down right now and pray a prayer of repentance and pray a prayer of, um, that, that would cause God to to celebrate your return. You want to pray a prayer right now. Say, Lord, I've missed my way. Lord, I, I have sinned against you. I need to come back home. Maybe it's not against God, but it's against your father. And you want to pray and say, Lord, I, I am going back to my father today. I'm going back to my father today. I've decided to return. And Lord, accept me back. You want to just pray that prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together and let's take our seats.